to E2 2019. Are you guys having a good weekend so far? I need you to be a little louder. Are you guys having a good weekend so far? That's what I thought. Does anybody here want to talk about freaks and geeks? Please welcome to the stage, John Francis Daly. First of all, welcome to Chicago, you guys. Are you guys excited to have them here? I feel special. Yeah, we believe you. Are you, are you guys excited to eat some deep dish pizza? That's the real question when you come to Chicago. How deep is it? Uh, it's very deep. Okay. I'll Martin is truly lactose intolerant. Yeah. You know, we, were, we had a whole plan to go to Lou Malnati's later, and it's... <laughs> we were going to swim in cheese. He's just going to have a corn crust with tomato sauce on it. It's real boring. Right? That's cool, right? That's <laughs> Chicago style. All right. Take it easy, That's guys. That's Martin style. Um, so it has been almost 19 years to the day since the tw 12th episode aired on NBC. And you remember that. That's just off the... It's 18 episodes, and it's off, that's just off the top of your no, head. No, but the 12th episode aired on oh, really? the 20th, wow. 19 years ago. So two days ago, uh, that was the last one. Of course, we know they aired the other ones, but I'm talking about the initial run before yeah. the fans like stepped in. And then the that MLB playoffs cut us off the air, if I remember yeah. correctly. So that's cool. And who, who wants to be Thanks, a millionaire? Thanks, Major League Baseball. <laughs> I don't see any who wants to be a millionaire panels. <laughs> well, the thing that's so amazing is, I mean, nowadays there's a lot of fan movements. There's like the Veronica Mars and obviously, and before you guys, there was, you know, with TOS, they got the show back on the air for another season. But you guys were kind of at the forefront of that, like fans speaking up and actually affecting a change, you know, getting the episodes in July, then aired three more and then the others released. So what, and, and again, here we are 19 years later talking about the show. What does that mean to you guys? And did you ever imagine that it would become like this sort of phenomena that it has been? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really cool to see that uh, it has impacted such a huge fan base. And uh, I think it's a testament to the, the writing and, and directing and, and creating on the part of uh, Judd Apatow and Paul Feig. Um, but it's obviously we knew we would be here sitting right here talking to all of you at that time that the show would get canceled and this is the outcome so yes we knew everything <laughs> that's because, what we were most excited about yeah we sat with a fortune teller before we started shooting and that gave us all this information And they just they laid it out for you right. so this yeah. is all no surprise great nope <laughs> we know all your questions but go ahead <laughs> well John since that's the case why don't you just answer them uh, the answer to the first one is yes. And yes. I, B and C. All of the above. Um, John, Paul has said that, you know, the Sam character was based on him. And so when you're, you know, coming into a series at that age, that's a lot of weight to carry as an actor. Um, you know, basically being the creator's voice on the show. What was that like for you and how did you develop the character? Um, I mean, I was, I was basically being uh, some version of myself. Uh, I was not what the character was described as when I auditioned. It was supposed to be really tall. Uh, the tall one ended up being Martin. Um, but uh, beyond that, I mean, it, it, it was, it was a, a large mantle to be, to be given, and I tried to be as, as true to myself and, and, and to the characters I possibly could, but, you know, the, the, the really fantastic writing certainly helped. Yeah, and Martin, you were 16, I believe, when you started the show. How did you... Correct. How did you create the character, and how did you guys actually work on the relationship between, you know, amongst yourselves? We all just became fast friends at the time, and that helped our chemistry on screen, for sure. But, but I was also written totally differently initially. So I... I were you... Because the way that the network testing system works is you, at, la at least at that time, we went up against other people. So there were like two sets of potential Freaks and Geeks cast, and we all went head to head with another person. And the character that I was, the, the, the way Bill was written initially was short and overweight. And I was tall and very thin, and I was like, I'm not gonna get this one. 
but let's give it a shot. And uh, ultimately, the way that that NBC ended up going was the way that Judd and Paul were pushing them, which was all, for all of us. They they got all the people that they wanted in those parts that that they had dreamt about. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of like you guys all, in a way, well, very much so, are perfectly cast. And you really can't, it's one of those casts where everyone just makes sense, you know? You can't see anyone else playing those characters. Yeah, I mean, I think they, they kind of wrote to, to us smartly. Um, and that's why I think your character was so well defined, was because you had such a strong voice and, and something that was so unique that they were like, why would we, why would we fight what is so naturally working here? And I think that, yeah, I mean, they wrote to everyone's strengths, I think. Like, when they saw that people were going in a particular direction, the characters that they had formed or what they were naturally doing, they went with it. I, I don't even know how I came up with, because that was so different from who I was off screen, but it was so easy to, like, fall into that thing, and that, that was what, what I read on the page. There must have been some version of you that existed within you that was just dying to come out then, huh? I mean, I was a sensitive boy. <laughs> we all were. So, I, I we can all tell. Were. You were very, and very hormonal. We fought, we fought a lot. You know, we were going through the change. You really did. <laughs> I was right in the middle of it. He was kind of past it at that point. He had body hair. I had none. I was willing uh, to go back to the changing period. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but that's actually interesting because, you know, being 13 and 16, the, the title of the show was kind of progressive at the time. I mean, now we probably wouldn't think Freaks and Geeks was an unusual title. But at the time, it was, you know, geek hadn't really evolved into this, like, cool term yet. Right. It was still kind of the redheaded stepchild. So what, what did you guys sort of have, what was your impression about a geek, and how did you sort of think about that stereotype or character? I mean, I think, yeah, like, like you said, outcasts uh, are now kind of the thing, and, and geekdom, and, and you know, being an uber fan of pop culture and comic books and stuff was still kind of a fringe uh, back then, uh, s especially in the 80s when the show was taking place. So I'd like to take full credit for creating, uh, <laughs> <laughs> creating the cool geeks. Thanks, guys. And you're welcome. I mean, but really, in all honesty, that's what you guys did, you know? I mean, you made... I mean, there was also, uh, I mean, just to tell you the general vibe in TV at that point, we were up against shows that were called, like, popular. <laughs> the antithesis of everything that we embodied as a television show, and that was the, the normal route. So here we were trying to break things up a little bit. Um, and I remember not loving the title because of because I was like, I don't, I, I, I have dreams of being popular. <laughs> oh man, like, this I, is like a therapy session. You yeah. want to lie down? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, How does that make you feel? Well. But you know, it is one of those things. You're at such a malleable age, you know, and it's just, it, you did make being a geek or, a, you know, to the, some extent, the freaks, accessible and relatable and I think that's what resonated with all of us so absolutely it certainly didn't resonate with the uh, network at the time they, they didn't sorry know what? what they didn't know what the hell to do with it but they uh, uh, I'm so glad that that with the advent of streaming media and the fact that people were able to catch it again on DVD and Netflix uh, that it has this this new kind of fan base and people that are, are now discovering it 20 years later, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and you guys have, have both gone on to do projects that I love. I love John, you, and Bones, but I want to talk about, yeah, amazing. Woo, woo! All right. <laughs> I kind of want to talk, I'm so impressed with your writing career. Oh, like, thank you. You're an amazing writer, and I just want to know, how did you start making that transition? Well, it was something I'd always wanted to do. I wanted to write and direct uh, since I was a little kid, um, but it, uh, as I've said, it's, it's really hard to uh, get a directing job when you're seven years old. <laughs> so the natural first step for me was acting, which was also something I was passionate about. And when I, when I got the opportunity to start writing and, and, and directing, I, I jumped at the, at the chance. And I'm so glad that my acting career kind of helped to kind of segue into this other part of my career that, I'm, that I was really excited about. 
Well, you mostly write with a partner. Yeah. Um, and what is that process like for you guys? How do you sort of riff ideas back and forth? And, and what's your working process? I, uh, he, he writes, I just get really drunk and say, that's really good, that's really good. What about, uh, no, never mind, I, 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 I lost it. But uh, what you're doing is great. Uh, no, it's, it's, we generally write in the same room. Um, we don't usually split up scenes. We're usually writing at the same time. What's great about having a writing partner is that you're able to create dialogue on the spot in a, in a kind of loose conversational manner. So it's almost like an improv session that ends up on the, on the page. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very collaborative. And same with our directing. We, we, we kind of do uh, it all at the same time. Is it harder to direct a project you've written or a project that was that was written by someone else? We have never really, uh, we've always done uh, drafts on projects that we've directed so uh, I would say it's way easier to, to direct what you write because it's it's in your voice. When we were, when we were just writing and, and we hadn't directed yet it, it was kind of frustrating and terrible to kind of hand that script over and for better or worse, you see what the director's vision ends up being. Sometimes it's in line with what you what you write, and sometimes it's the incredible Burt Wonderstone. <laughs> That's a joke. I don't I I don't mean it. <laughs> I love everyone involved in that movie. Very convincing, John. Yes, very convincing, um, Martin. Who is it? It's me. You Wait. were in my favorite episode of television ever produced, which is the Tip to Tip episode for Silicon Valley. You are a freaking cool. genius in it. I love you on the show. I wouldn't have pegged you for a dick joke girl. <laughs> you don't know me very well. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> um, I want to know, back at the beginning of Silicon Valley, did you guys have any idea how genius this cast and the writing and the whole thing, you know, when did you realize it was coming together in such a, such a special way? Weird, I, I, weirdly, in a new way, when we were shooting that particular scene, because there was, um, because I think a lot of the stuff that we did up until that point there were there was an awareness and we knew how the comedy worked of it and for that we kept leaning into it a little too much and at one point alec who was directing that episode came in and he said all of the jokes that you guys are making are funny but the most important thing is that we take this entire mathematical equation very seriously and then that changed that shifted the way that we thought about not only the way that the show, like it made, it, it changed the way we thought about that scene and that joke and also the entire show, I think. Well, yeah, because the, the, the mathematical problem is the catalyst for... And I mean, that's a real equation that guys at Stanford figured out. <laughs> that's um, what I was going to ask So you. they're cool uh, that they did that. What, what was that phone call like to those guys at Stanford? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I wasn't on that one. Um, I'm a little bummed you didn't ask me about the tip to tip episode of Bones, though. Yeah. I mean, go ahead. What's your deal? I thought you knew about all the dick jokes. <laughs> well, you'll find out over the next 45 minutes, won't you? <laughs> We're going to open it up to questions because that all is right. the right thing to do at this point. Um, and if you have a question, you can get in line. We'll get to as many people as we can. And while they're getting themselves organized, you know, everybody in here loves you guys, projects you've been a part of. They love Freaks and Geeks. What kind of, you know, shows are you guys watching? What do you geek out about? What are you passionate about? Music, literature, film? I am a huge fan of the show Succession on HBO. No one seems oh, to be talking about it nearly as much as they should. Uh, I love it. Uh, Martin, TV? I get into things late. Um, have you guys ever heard benefit. of The Simpsons? I love Lucy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love Lucy. Um, Who's ever heard of it? Uh, well, yeah, well, I've just started watching uh, The Assassination of Giovanni Versace. It's, I, I enjoy it. So that was from 2015. Um, that's good, but that's the beauty of like you know the streaming services now. Is yeah. like you were saying with Freaks and Geeks, you can rediscover material that you may have missed the first time around. Yeah, I really actually enjoy waiting. Like I just uh, po uh, on our flight over, I was just listening to a podcast called Root of Evil, and it's super interesting. It's about the Black Dahlia murders, but it's 
there's two more episodes left. I don't like, I don't want to sit and wait after I've gotten to episode six for two more to come out. It's so nice to just wait until it's all out and then you can binge it. Absolutely. And then purge it. Then I vomit it all up onto <laughs> someone else. You take it to the next level. Yeah. I love that. Hi. Danielle from Chicago. Hi, Danielle. Would you have an interest in doing a reboot of the series as so many series are doing these days? That's an interesting question. I don't know I don't, that it... I don't that, think so. I don't think anything could do it justice at this point. I, I, don't, I don't know what the gain from it would be. As an actor, too, it's, it's, it's hard to answer that because... Yeah, it's it really, really out, of our, up to, out of our control. Yeah, it's really up to the creators. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to do an unofficial version of it. Yeah, just on is. our own. But we could start one tonight. I mean, you know what? We'll do it. A two-man show I have called Geek and Geek. I have a script call that Sam I've been... <laughs> what? Call What's Sam Levine. We'll call oh. Sam. Call yeah. Sam Levine. Yeah, if you have his number, feel free. I would imagine that if they're ever, they did revisit it, they would have to have Paul and Judd attached for it Absolutely. to make any sense. Yeah. If, if I found out they were doing it, I would jump at the, at the chance. I just don't think it's necessarily in the cards. Yeah. yeah, it seems like a hard thing to do justice to, but especially because of the way that it all turned out. Like, I think they felt so fortunate to get to 18. Like, we shot the last episode as, what, episode 14 or something? We shot it early because they could feel that we were going to get canned. And, uh, and then actually got to round out the full season. So it feels, it feels the way they intended it to feel, like a, like a very long, awesome movie. Like yeah. it, has a, it has a real through line, and the characters grow and develop, and they, I, I just don't know if the, if, you know, I think it'd be a hard thing to do justice to bringing back. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Hi, guys. Um, I am, love Freaks and Geeks, but uh, mostly I love Bones, and I love Party Down. All right. Um, I have watched them thousands of times at this so point. So you don't love Freaks and Geeks? I mean, I love Freaks and Geeks, but Party Down is what makes me laugh a new time every single time I watch it. No and way. I was wondering, because it was in a certain you know, point in your careers, what made you decide to take on those projects? And what was your favorite episode, memory, bit from each of those? Well, you turned down Breaking Bad to go and do Bones. <laughs> well, no, that's not true. But uh, <laughs> I love these rumors I, uh, you're starting. Uh, it's funny, I, I did, uh, I don't think I've ever said this. <laughs> I, uh, but thank you, Martin. <laughs> I, 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 was, uh, I had auditioned for Breaking Bad at the same time that I got an offer to do Bones, and uh, they called me back to do uh, the screen test for Breaking Bad, and my agents at the time, I have different agents now, were like, <laughs> you, you, uh, you can't because you, you're ar you've already started signing the contracts on Bones, which was like a, an offer. I, I had an audition for that. And they were like, there's, there's no way to do it, to get out of it contractually. I later learned that uh, there was a way to do it and that, uh, that my agent and Aaron Paul's agent were the same. Uh, so they wanted to make as much money as they could. Oh. So agents are awesome, is the moral but, of this story. <laughs> but honestly, like, I, I'm, so, I'm so glad that, uh, that I did Bones and the fact that it allowed me to, as part of a, a large supporting cast, uh, write, which I probably wouldn't have been able to do on Breaking Bad. That's what I tell myself. <laughs> That's a good, uh, you know... A good, a good hey, it, it really, turn. it all worked out. I, I, don't, I like no, the no regrets. That, the way that you asked that question was as if there were, we had a lot more control over everything than we actually did. Like why we chose those things. They, they had written in the pilot of Party Down, a Martin Star like character, <laughs> and then, and my agent had read it, and he was like, hey. You think I should reach out to him and let him know that you might want to do this? And Sam Levine had already passed. So. Yeah. <laughs> Initially, he was written into it. Uh, they just went through all the freaks and geeks. Um, but I, yeah, that's how, that's how that ended up coming along. And Lizzie, yeah, I think Lizzie Kaplan was, uh, we were both kind of put into it after they had already done a, uh, they had made a pilot to sell it initially. Like they had uh, created their own pilot and shot it and then sold it and then reshot, we reshot the pilot. Thank you. Hi. How you guys doing? I'm Ed from Chicago. 
Uh, I'm wondering if you ever saw, or if it existed, like your plot lines for what would have been season two, or what would you have liked? Where would you have liked to have seen Sam and Bill go? They, um, they talked about it a little bit. Yeah, we were told. Well, I was told that uh, I, uh, because I was growing at a ridiculous rate at that point. Um, still are. Still, still are. <laughs> Uh, downtown, if you know what I mean. No. His feet. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Massive feet. Dick joke. I'm growing right now. He was a size uh, six when he showed up today. I was talking about my shoes, that's right. Yep. So I was told that they were going to incorporate my being tall and maybe getting into sports or something, which I'm glad it, we didn't get to season two because I'm really bad at sports and it would have been, been tough for me. Uh, but yeah, something uh, something to to do with my, my the physical changes that I was going through as I as I became a man. Yeah, th they had talked about me becoming a jock potentially because I was starting to work out with Franco. He was ripped. He he, he won't say it, but he was so muscular. And if you ever see him in those tight shirts, they, he looks like a god. It's there ridiculous. There was the, the the scene where I'm putting on where the the Halloween scene where I'm putting on the. The oh, what's her? Name? What's the character's name? A bionic woman. Bionic woman. Where I'm getting that that outfit on, they wouldn't shoot me without my shirt on fully. So they had the stuffed bra on already, because I looked to, and they like came in and like had a severe talking to on that day with me. And they were like, "You gotta stop working out." It's the this biggest <laughs> humble brag in the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's an awesome story. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi. Hey, I'm Jason from Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, you guys both worked with uh, Judd Apatow after uh, Freaks and Geeks, so what was it like working with him as opposed to other writers and producers and directors you've worked with? Uh, the same. <laughs> um, I've enjoyed working with, I've enjoyed working with him uh, every time that I've had the opportunity. I don't think I've ever worked yeah. with them since Freaks and Geeks. Yeah, I think that might have been the only time John did. I did. We, we, uh, we wrote something that he was going to produce for a while uh, that never happened because of the studio, but uh, n never anything that made it to, to screen since Freaks and Geeks. Thank you. Hi. Hi, uh, Sergio from the southeast side of Chicago. I was just um, nice, a local. I was just wondering, like, what are some of your, like your favorite scenes filming? Ever not freaks and geeks. From today. freaks and geeks, favorite uh, scenes. For me, it was dancing in front of the mirror in the Parisian <laughs> night, night suit. suit. Nice. Um, I was able to really let loose and show my moves to the world. <laughs> yeah, not good at sports, but a great dancer. Mm, dancing is the sport of love. All right, very cool. <laughs> um, I, I, I remember us like the, the fight scene in the pilot. <laughs> that was really fun. Uh, where I, someone was on my back. I just remember it was like just mayhem in a really fun way where we got to like be physical. Like there was a physical comedy bit of it all that was really fun to play with. Um, but the whole show was really great. I don't have any like bad memories that have stuck no. with me. Martin would constantly torment other people. Torment me and make myself. me laugh. Uh, and so it was always fun and also challenging to work with him because he would always try to make me laugh in scenes. And I, I would break very easily. Uh, working with uh, uh, Joe Flaherty was also oh, yeah. similarly amazing, so amazing because the guy is so damn funny. If you guys haven't seen SCTV, I suggest yeah. you watch the DVDs or Blu-rays of that. Uh, but he was so funny in those dinner scenes, and I would always kind of just stuff my mouth with food so that I wouldn't be so obviously laughing at what he was doing. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good point. I mean, you obviously both do a ton of comedy. Um, what is the... <laughs> when you start losing it in a scene, what do you do? What's the tactic? If you can't eat... What, what, how do you... I, I, I asked if to, to go back and, and do it again. I mean, they, what was great was there was such a looseness with the, with the, the crew and directors that you could, you could go back and take a line again if you, if you mess it up or if you laugh 
Um, but I do recall there being one time that it, it became an, an actual issue on the pilot. And I was also nervous. I think it was our first shoot day uh, when uh, Mr. Mr. Kowchewski Chow- comes up and is like uh, berating Alan for smashing my Twinkies. And he says, he's like, very, he's got a very deep voice in that scene. He's like, Alan. Uh, well, do you have anything better to do than smash Mr. Weir's Twinkies? Wow, it's still in my head. Uh, and, uh, and Sam Levine uh, said to me, like, it's funny the way he says Alan. And so every time he would say, Alan, I, I would just start laughing and laughing. And I think we went through 15 takes of that. And I was, I was simultaneously laughing and also terrified that they were going to fire me. Hi. Hi, uh, David from, well, I was born in New York, I currently live in Chicago, but when I went to school in New York, um, my school would constantly use freaks and geeks in health class to teach us. So just, how do you get, yeah. (laughs) Especially the episode Tests and Breasts, which I guess makes sense. So how do you guys feel that um, your show has been used and, you know, not only inspired fans, but also inspired the American educational system to teach sex ed? How do you guys feel about that? I think it says a lot about the American educational system. <laughs> I'm just glad that I was able to show kids my age that puberty will someday come uh, and to be patient. <laughs> That's the name of the game. Thank you. Is that surprising to you guys to hear that, you know, the episodes were used in a health class somewhere? Yeah, I've never heard yeah, that one before. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hi, guys. <laughs> hey, cheers. My name is Violet. Thank you. Um, born and raised in Chicago. So nice. I just wanted to know, I'm an expiring actress, and I just wanted to know what or who um, pushed you guys, because you guys were so small in Freaks and Geeks. And I, was, I see you I now, and I'm pretty, like, I was a tall. Well, you were I mean, tall. Six feet. Yeah, I don't you know. guys were young. Were you watching the very young. right show? <laughs> very young. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. But I'm like, who, who or what pushed you to be like, you know what, Hollywood or LA, everything is like dog eat dog. What, I don't know, what made you think that movies, directing, writing, acting, continuing forward was going to be the right path for you guys individually? I guess, how did you keep persistent? How did you... Yeah, because yeah. it's hard you out were, here. You were pretty young, <laughs> so I'd imagine your parents got it going, and then once you're out in L.A., then you're like, oh, I've done a TV show yeah, now. Yeah, I mean, I've I, done, uh, my, my uh, dad was a Broadway actor, so every weekend after school, I would go to New York, uh, the, the city, and, um, and do my homework in the backstage uh, w- of whatever show he was on. And that kind of opened my eyes to the idea that acting isn't, couldn't, d- doesn't have to just be a dream and, and could actually be realized. Because I had always wanted to do it. And I remember I, I told my folks uh, that I wanted an agent <laughs> when, I was, <laughs> when I was eight. Because I figured, OK, everyone has an agent that's yeah. working. So I guess that's the first step. And they were, they were totally supportive. Uh, and I got an agent, and that's kind of how it started. But I think without my, my parents being really supportive and, and not pushing me, it's what kind of kept me going. Because I think that very often with kid actors, their parents kind of push them into something that they don't necessarily want to do. Uh, and so at a certain point, when they, when they really have their own voice, they're like, I don't like this. This is, this is not what I was, what I was doing. Fortunately, I was the exception to that. I grew up in L.A., so I, it was just kind of something that I grew up doing and loving, but I never thought that I would, never thought that opportunity would come along and I would be sitting here now having a body of work to look back on and be proud of. So I feel very fortunate. Yeah, thank you. And good thank luck with you. your career. Good luck. Yeah, good thank luck. Yeah, best of luck. Get an agent. <laughs> yeah, that's, it worked for him. <laughs> John, who are some of your... Um, inspirations as a director and a writer? Who do you kind of look up to or, or study? Uh, I was such a huge fan of Steven Spielberg. I mean, it's the most obvious answer in a way. But uh, he really did manage to cover every genre of film. Um, comedy less so. But <laughs> he, he was really like a, a, 
very inspirational figure for me. He was, uh, and, and also I think as a kid, um, his movies were so, uh, a lot of them were so geared toward families and children and without kind of uh, placating or, or talking down to them. And so it was such a great way in for me to see, okay, this is, this is kind of what I want to do, where, I, where I'm able to speak to a, a wide range of audiences with each film that I do. Sometimes, you know, we do R-rated comedies that are not at all for kids, but then we get to do, you know, animated children's movies and, and Spider-Man. Um, and so it's really, uh, it's, I would like to sort of take a, a page from his book in trying to, cover every genre because there isn't any one that I that I like more than the other. I like them all. Yeah, well, Spider-Man Homecoming was awesome, so... Thank you. Yes. Well, it's, all, it's all this guy. <laughs> yeah. It was... It yeah. Was. You, do you hear the clap that happened after that? <laughs> <laughs> Favorite Spielberg movie? Favorite Spielberg movie? Oh, gosh. Well, you know, when I was a kid, it was Jurassic Park. Yeah. yeah. That's what... That's I. I remember uh, the first time I saw it. It really uh, it changed the way I saw movies, and it turned movies into more more than just a movie, but an actual experience and and a memory that I I still so clearly remember the first time I saw that film. Um, and uh, so yeah, that's probably it. That's awesome. Hi. Hi, uh, so I'm Max from Northside Chicago. Mario. Yes, Mario as well. Thank you. <laughs> um, so going back to Spider-Man Homecoming, you know, it's part of the MCU, you know, and that's such a big thing. Like, that is a multi-billion dollar, like, universe right now. Don't put pressure on him. <laughs> yeah, well, take it easy. Uh, I mean, like, you know, your character may have been snapped, for all you know. Uh, what's it like to be a part of that universe? And, John, what's it like to know that you've, like, written, that you've helped evolve characters in this, like, gigantic universe? It was super cool to be a part of it. Um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> uh, it was super cool to be a part of it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Away with game. Mario. That's a dick no, answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, no, it, you know, it's a lot of responsibility. You try not to think about it too much when you're writing it, and we approached it sort of the same way we approached any other movie that we had written where uh, it passed the I would watch it test. Um, like the magician movie? Oh. Oh. Oh my God. I Just joking around, guys. Never Come on. <laughs> Grow a funny bone. To be fair, there's some very funny moments in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> that came off the page. Well, um, I, I thought initially that I had gotten the job because of John, and then later found out that that wasn't. I was the campaigning case. against him. Yeah. <laughs> that he specifically wanted me not to get the part. Even before my name was brought up, uh, he said, not on the list, definitely, is Martin. Um, Our title page was Spider-Man, not with Martin Starr. Yeah. The tagline works, you know? Yeah, exactly. I'm kidding. Um, but it, it's very cool, and, and it is cool to see how their whole system works, because the, there's a reason why they are so successful as a company and, and as a production company. And uh, they're very specific about the way that they tell those stories and it's very important to them to get them right. Um, and it's, it's very, they treat everyone with respect. I, I really enjoyed my experience with them. Thank you. Yeah, Marvel's been very, um, very honor, honoring origin stories of all their characters. So they're, you know, they're an incredible company to work for. It's amazing. They are, and, yeah. and I think what they also do so well is uh, they put real importance on, on the film itself and, and sometimes it strays from the source material, it strays from, from what's in the comics, because there is an inherent difference between reading a comic book and, and, and having that sort of narrative in a story and watching a movie. Um, so and especially when, like, it's, with something like Spider-Man, it's already had two iterations before oh it. It had been done so, the so many so, times. So you need to reinvent yeah. what, you're, what you're doing. Yeah, you have to make it fresh. I don't yeah. think anyone wanted to see Uncle Ben die anymore, and that was, that was definitely a mandate it's on sad. Yeah, it was sad enough the first time. Mm -hmm. Martin, who are some of your, um, I don't know if, if inspirations is the right word, but actors that you have 
maybe modeled your style after or look up to or? I grew up watching uh, Jim Carrey. He was a big, I was a huge fan of Jim Carrey. It was weird meeting him. He was at our Freaks and Geeks rap party. And, uh, oh, that's Judd, awesome. Judd knows him, obviously, from Cable Man and, uh, or Cable Guy, and uh, they're, they're going to do a remake, and it's called Cable Man. Um, <laughs> but he was super nice, I remember, and, and having Ben Stiller on the show was very cool. I mean, I, I grew up really loving comedy, but then as I got older, people like Ed Norton and, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of people that I'm huge fans of that I really enjoy watching. Yeah. It's cool now that some of them I get to work with. Yeah. It's like, uh, very cool. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, Cedric from Naperville. Uh, big fan, Where's guys. Where's Naperville? Oh, it's uh, maybe 20 minutes southwest. Or no, 40 minutes. Not totally a local, but yeah, you're really. in the area. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, big we fan. Big fan of you guys. Thank you. Um, Thank you. This might be a tough question to answer on the spot, but... Okay, then don't ask it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, if you're only allowed to watch one movie for the rest of your life, what movie would that be and why? Groundhog's Day. I mean, obvious, right? I mean, okay. uh, Honestly, that's a pretty good answer. I would, uh, <laughs> I would put that up there for me, too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What, what All right. <laughs> I feel bad. Uh, <laughs> what movie would you watch over and over? Uh, yeah, what's your answer? I'm a huge fan of uh, The Life Aquatic. It's a Wes Anderson movie. Not The Incredible yeah. Burt Wonderstuff? I, yeah, I don't yeah, understand yeah, no. why you wouldn't. That would be my second Interesting. Choice. Oh, Most sure. Say that. Yeah. Well, you only get one choice, buddy. Then it would, be, it would definitely be Bert Wonderson. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We I knew you were kidding it. when you said yeah. Life Aquatic. Yeah. We all knew you were kidding. Yeah. So, thank you. That's thank a great you. question. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Ooh, sorry. Um, so, Hot mic. Very hot mic, and I'm a loud talker. Theater training. Um, All right. So I, my name is Jenna. I'm a college student here in the city, but I'm originally from Colorado. Um, so I'm actually the same age as the show Freaks and Geeks, and it's really interesting because I, it's kind of become a cult phenomenon amongst young people. You know, I watched it because my friends said, "Oh, the show on Netflix, you got to watch it," and so I watched it, and I told my friends, and you know, it's become this. It's become this whole thing now, you know, 15, 20 years later. How do you feel about this show kind of reemerging as like a cult classic in a way and still speaking to people, young people today? It feel, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but to me it feels like it just cycles through this. Like every few years a new group of people get the, the fascination for it. But it seems, it, the cool thing about it is it just is like spreading culturally. Like just, just feels like it's more than just a cult classic like pretty it, it's in everyone's everyone who kind of like loves tv and is aware of tv and kind of enjoys that kind of story and can relate to it in any way they're very aware of um that show because you can relate to it it's so yeah. human um yeah i think what's so great about it uh is how universal it is and how even though it takes place in 1980 you watch it now and all the problems that these kids are going through are the same kind of problems that we're going through minus you know social media which is a huge problem uh but i do think that um i think that that it just resonates with with people and and there's never a there was never for any person uh uh not a time well that's a that's a weird double negative there you got <laughs> everyone, this buddy ev i got hold on just give me a second give me give me two seconds Okay, so everybody, hold on, I need another one. You can do it. So everyone has an awkward stage. Yeah. There we go. That's oh, yeah. all I was trying to say. <laughs> you did it. And my awkward stage is right now. <laughs> this stage is your awkward stage. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Hi. Hi, um, I'm Sarah. I'm from Minneapolis. And hey, Sarah. Hello. And my this is Chicago. Yes. Uh, my question's for Martin. I'm a huge fan of your characters in several shows, so I wanted to ask you oh. between Bill from Freaks and Geeks, Roman from Party Down, or Guilfoyle on Silicon Valley, which one is your favorite to play and which one you are the most like? Um, I would say if you asked my girlfriend, she would tell you that I'm becoming more like Gilfoyle than I would probably <laughs> like to admit. And it's become like a, um, 
it's like a, a safety mechanism or something where if ever I'm feeling awkward, I can just kind of retreat into myself. Um, but I think I'm the most, I'm, I'm probably, I don't know who I'm the most like. I, I hope that answers that question because <laughs> overall, I'd like to think I'm more like Bill because I think he was really sweet and endearing and had, um, had a huge heart which uh, John will tell you that definitely isn't the case. Um, <laughs> but I, I think I liked playing Bill the most because he was sweet and he had big eyes and, and like had trouble. Like Roman and uh, Guilfoyle are both very pessimistic characters and are kind of choosing a troubled life by their perspective. And it's hard to do that for a long time. Like it just kind of weighs on you every day to be in that mindset, which maybe it seems like, you know, as an actor, you go to work, you do that, and then you go home. But it all kind of really sits with you over time. Um, and so there was a lightness that came with when we were shooting Freaks and Geeks that was really fun and enjoyable. And over the course of seasons and seasons playing characters that are more pessimistic, it like weighs on you, on your, on your soul, on your person. So it, it, uh, it's something I kind of have to actively break free from in order not to get stuck in that place. It's a great question. Thank you so much. Hi. Hi, I'm Anna from Green Bay. Hey, um, Green Bay. Yeah. Go thank Pack Go. You. Look, I know bears, 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 bears. I get it, I get it, but go Pack Go. Oh, man. All right. <laughs> statement to make. <laughs> um, okay, so my question is, um, so obviously Freaks and Geeks got canceled pretty early on, didn't get a second season, What? Which sucks. <laughs> Holy I know, shnikes. I know, I know, I know, I know. Sucks, sorry to bring up a sore subject. But um, when, what was like, if, was there a defining moment where you were like, whoa, this show is going to last forever? Like it is, has turned into an iconic, like cult classic. Like, like, when did they first realize that... Like, this is going to be a thing. <laughs> when did we do the, um, the signing at uh, Tower Records? Oh, that was big, yeah. yeah oh, that's, that's cool. We did a big signing where Judd and Paul really empowered the fans of the show at that point to come out and be a part of meeting us and there being a signing and a big DVD release. That's right. And I think at that point, I thought that there was more... Like, I thought it had just kind of faded away. But at that point, I realized... Oh, there's, there is still like a big group of people who this really meant a lot to. And that's a, that's a powerful feeling to have done anything in your life that people respond to in such a passionate way. Yeah, I mean, as far as the cultural impact, I would say it was, it was talking to people that had seen it and, and, and say how, you know, huge it was for them and, and how it kind of helped to shape their lives. Uh, for me, just when I saw the pilot, I remembered thinking for the first time. I I, I thought this is this is unlike anything I've ever seen on TV. Uh, feels like a movie. I did not know if it was going to be a hit, which it wasn't at the time. Um, not to brag. <laughs> <laughs> hey, ladies. Uh, but it was uh, it was a it was a really like powerful moment for me because when you're shooting something, you you get the sense that it's going to turn out great, but you don't you don't know for sure because uh, so much of it is in the post-production and editing and music and all that and so after having it s seen it all cut together it was uh it was it was a big moment for for me definitely yeah thank you martin you kind of mentioned that they were rushing filming like episode 14 because it was kind of the tonality was we know we're going to get canceled and and do you think that's why the 18 episodes kind of play like a long feature? Because they were yeah. able to wrap it all up? They, I, I think we knew, so like the, the way, if I, if I remember correctly, uh, the, the way that they order episodes were usually in chunks. And you would get an order for the back nine, which was the last nine episodes of a season usually. And, um, and we, I think, had done 12 episodes. And then they started ordering more, but they'd order like two at a time. So we, we didn't know week to week what week we were going to not get an order for more episodes. And that put it pretty heavy on their shoulders and on their, on their conscience to try and get it done. Like 
they didn't want this to end as an abrupt season ending. They wanted to have some finality to the storyline, and so they wrote, they had the trajectory of the whole season, and they wrote the final episode earlier on than they had anticipated, so that at the very least, you would watch 12 episodes or 13 episodes and then get an, an episode that was wrapping it up to some degree. Yeah. I think also the fact that they wrote an, an ending early on uh, allowed them to really push the envelope with the kind of material that they were writing for yeah. subsequent episodes. Um, it was almost like they were trolling the network because oh boy. every episode was something new where the network was like, we can't, what are you guys doing? We can't do that. We're trying to, trying to get people to watch it. And they also wanted specific things like a pregnancy episode and a this and a that that and, were like traditional tropes of television. And they television. always shut it down. Yeah. I mean, I and remember the, the, the episode when um, uh, Seth Rogen's character is dating a girl that was born with both genitalia. It was like... It, no one had ever done that before, and it wasn't it wasn't like a, a joke either. It was it was like it was it handled with care. Forced and, him yeah. to kind of uh, to question his own sexuality, and the network was like, "Guys, what are you doing?" This is <laughs> it was like way crazy. too heavy a topic for them to. But want to I'm take so on. glad they were able to do stuff like that because you never see other uh, other shows that tackle episodes that are so honest and weird. Well, especially with yeah. a pretty young cast, you know what I mean. So. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. that no definitely kidding. inspired a lot of conversation <laughs> <laughs> behind the scenes. Hi. Hi, I'm Paul. I'm from the suburbs of Chicago. I'm a little bit further out than Naperville, which you guys are now. Nice, a with. rich kid. Uh, we get it. <laughs> so the last person legit just asked a question that I was going to, and I was so paranoid about that happening. I have a backup question. You are so, well prepared. I know. So being in a room full of aspiring writers and artists and actors, I was wondering if you could talk about what it feels like to put yourself out there and have some things hit, but then also have some things miss, and what it takes to find the strength to get out there and try again. It's a good life lesson for sure to like believe in something and then watch it fail. <laughs> um, but I, like, it's just in a much, on a much bigger scale, the normal lessons I think of life, of trying new things and experimenting a bit. I mean, right after Freaks and Geeks, I did a movie called Cheats that came and uh, immediately went. And it was, uh, I thought it was, I was like, great, I'm doing a movie. Every movie is in theaters and has some success and this will be a big, cool movie. And you've never heard of it and there's a reason why. <laughs> uh, because some, you know, some of the politics ended up destroying that movie from the inside and so it just didn't end up coming out at all in theaters. But that was a huge lesson for me to, to really uh, temper my expectations because you get too big, like you, when you expect too much of a system that you can't really control, all you can do is give, your, give everything to what you're doing, writing, directing, acting, uh, producing, everything that you can put into it, make sure that you're doing everything you can and then you just kind of push and hope everybody else is doing their job to make sure that this thing sees the light of day and that, that people respond the way that you hope they do. Yeah, I would say, to add to that, that failure is one of the most important parts of this business, in that it uh, is not final, unless you make it final. Um, you, can, you can quit at, on, on the heels of, of a failure, but just know that everybody fails. And for everything that you write or direct or act in that people love, there's something that people don't love. And you have to just constantly keep going if, if that's what you want to do. Because um, if you don't fail, uh, odds are you're not working or, or uh, you haven't like, been driven even more by that failure to continue to succeed and keep plugging away. Even the people that seem like they are on cloud nine always have something going on in their work. Like us. People love everything. <laughs> uh, there's always something that, that we don't know about that they're going through where they think, ah, oh, even if a movie's a massive success, odds are whoever made it is thinking, why didn't it make $50 million more to beat out this movie or whatever? So it's just part of the game and it sucks and it hurts, but it's also kind of great because it allows you to see both sides and it makes the success so much sweeter. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good job on that backup question. And those failures help you really appreciate what you do have. As a side note. <laughs> Isn't it kind of interesting how sometimes as an artist you'll go into a project like you were saying, that film, and you'll think this is going to be really great, and then sometimes you'll approach a project and be like, yeah, maybe, and oftentimes it's the opposite of what you initially think. Have you yeah. found that to be true? Oh, totally. Ooh. Yeah, it's never what you expect it to be. And then you just learn not to have expectations, and you just <laughs> put a lot of love into everything you do and hope it turns out great. When we worked on Game Night, we were convinced film oh, is so you. good. Oh, thank so you. So good. Uh, but we didn't know that people would clap or say that. Uh, when, we, when we made it, we thought, okay, odds are everyone's going to hate this. <laughs> and for, I, I don't know why. I think it was because we'd been burned in the past, uh, and we also, um, it was, we were attempting to do something a little different in terms of really crossing genres where we, we paid a lot of attention on the thriller component of the movie as much as the comedy and and that was a risk and something that we were very reluctantly willing to take but at the same time like we were fully prepared for no one to see it and for everyone to hate it and that's kind of a it's kind of a comfortable way going into things because then nothing can really hurt you <laughs> And we're hosting a game night tonight where we're going to be the killers. Everyone's welcome. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Christina from Rockford. Illinois. Um, hello. Yeah. Nice. Or uh, boo. Wait. I think you've, feelings. You've, you've boo. Got it. Where, where's Rockford? Um, it's about it's closer to the Wisconsin border. So like the, like, below You're a Wisconsin. You're yelling over yeah. you. I don't know what the deal is with Rockford. You like but. cheddar cheese? No, I'm lactose intolerant. Oh, man. <laughs> Same Z's. Enjoy a corn crust with tomato sauce. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll see you at the Chicago deep dish uh, tomato factory. Oh, yeah. Um, my question is, since um, you're both really young actors during the Freaks and Geeks, and you guys were also going through your adolescent stage and your hormones, I was wondering, see, since... Okay. What are you getting in? <laughs> what are you getting into here? It's true. It's true. <laughs> Um, I was wondering, since uh, if you, since you were going through that phase, if you learned anything during like any, like your characters or any other characters, and use that in your personal lives and learn from it. That's a really good question. Yeah. I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm still awkward around women, so I didn't learn <laughs> that. <laughs> um, let me think for a second because I want to give an honest answer to this. I was very sensitive when I was shooting Freaks and Geeks. I contribute some of that, I attribute some of that to hormones, but also to being an actor, and we're all weird. Uh, but uh, I think that doing that show and having gone through kind of a roller coaster of emotions, because there was a lot going on behind the scenes, like we were, we had like crushes on cast members and stuff, and there was a lot of feuding and competition between all of us. Oh yeah, uh, very much like you would see in in high school, because that's kind of what our high school experience was. And I think it allowed me to uh, gain more perspective and kind of have a little bit more control of my emotions, uh, which has helped me because. Otherwise, I'd be sobbing right now. <laughs> For no apparent reason. No, I, uncontrollably. You just say a word and I start crying. <laughs> Rockford. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Hi. Hey, my name is Daniela. I'm from here, but I live in D.C. Um, Martin, okay. Yeah, it's all right. Um, okay. Hey, Martin Starr, hi. Hi, how are you? Really good, thanks. Wonder Woman. That's for costume currently. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> So uh, one of the cool things about Freaks and Geeks is that there are a lot of names that got really big later on that show. I'm wondering if you guys heard think... about them. Yeah, a couple of maybe. Yeah, I mean mostly you, obviously. Uh, but I'm wondering if you guys stay in touch and what that's like when you all get back together. It is like one of those shows where everyone's working. Like literally everyone from the show is really successful at what they're doing. Pretty much everybody. Just about, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um. it's really cool that way. Martin, stop. Uh. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's weird. There's something in the, the craft service there. That yeah. Well, it just shows that, you know... Cocaine! Jay no, I'm kidding. Any kids? <laughs> that isn't a thing. 
Um, I mean, it shows that Judd had like a very good sensibility of who he was casting, you know, because absolutely. Yeah. yeah, they I think they saw something in each of us that probably a lot of casting directors hadn't seen yet because uh, yeah. we were all strange. Um, and perhaps something we didn't see in ourselves. Like I feel certainly. like that, that show gave me a lot of confidence to keep doing it. I wouldn't be an actor now if I hadn't had that experience and someone like like a, a specific experience like that where they were so nurturing and they really made me feel comfortable in an environment that I had no, I would have had no comfort being in with no experience, et cetera. But they really gave everyone, uh, they empowered everyone in what they were doing. Um, I think we need to have Busy host a reunion on her show, Busy yes. Tonight. That would be like the best. She's a good host. You get, you get all you guys on there. And, boring and host. She's hosting a show now. Um, well, I, yeah, I guess we, I, we, we kind of keep in touch with probably the same people we, yeah. were, we were friends with. Like I think some, just like any you know, group of kids that, that uh, graduated together from a TV show. <laughs> there's, um, some, there's some estranged family members. Yeah, we, but we're all still connected. I, I, you know, we, some, some you see more than others, but you know, I still see Seth every once in a while and Linda and I see Sarah Hagen now more consistently. We've kind of become friends again. And John she has and a I, baby, Sarah Hagen. Yeah, she is a kid. Um, and she's an amazing, you can buy her pottery. She makes absolutely effing amazing pottery. That's awesome. She's an incredible artist. Um, but yeah, I think John and I are probably the closest, like I see you the most out of everybody. It's the longest lasting yeah. friendship, I think, between all the Freaks and Geeks, I would say. Yeah, we get together pretty regularly, too. It's true, isn't Dinner it? And stuff. Think yeah. about it. Like, yeah. everyone has kind of gone their, their separate all, yeah. ways over time. Yeah. Um, but like every family, you know, it's, it's a weird ebb and flow of, Hanging out with you. I was 14, so I was younger than everyone else on the show. But I felt so even it took then, a while for me to like get into the fold and grow a goatee. Once, once I was able to grow this goatee, <laughs> I got it. some calls. <laughs> Most Thank of them you. were shave off the goatee. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I called you so much about that. Yeah. Thank you, and you look great, by the way. And we're gonna take one last quick question from you, and and then unfortunately that's all we have time for. Hi. Hi. I'm Stacy from Madison, Wisconsin. Nice. <laughs> My dad's um, from Sheboygan, Wisconsin. <laughs> I'm familiar. Um, I was wondering, in Busy Phillips' book, she wrote about, and this is going to be kind of a downer. Oh, um, she, boy. Great way to end. Yeah. Uh, are you sure we can take one more question? <laughs> Maybe two more? She wrote about um, basically how horrible James Franco was and how he was very misogynistic. Um, I'm wondering if you guys, being on the younger, you know, side of the cast, were kind of aware of it, or well, you know what? I think that we'll we'll kind of leave I mean, we, that. Honestly, one. we weren't there for any it's of that. An easy yeah. answer for me. I wasn't there yeah. for for any of that. Those weren't things that we were aware of. We were on the geek side. Yeah, and and you know, I mean, everybody obviously has different perspectives of working with different people. So that's one person's perspective. But from everything I've heard, you guys all got along really, really well, and it shows on camera. That's will, why the show is still successful. I do yeah. appreciate the courage that it took to ask that question, though. And, you should and take up journalism, I mean it. I, and I read some of the book as well, and in particular that part of it, and, and I will say that there is a, she, the way, she kind of infers that there was like a boys club of, of the show that didn't necessarily support You're her You're so as well. nervous right now. But, <laughs> but, but, all of, but all of our experiences were really in support of uh, making sure everyone was comfortable. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't, I wasn't there for any of those things, but all of my experiences were Paul and Judd and all of the producers and all of the writers going above and beyond to make sure that everybody in every experience was comfortable. So, so uh, I will speak to that and, and in, uh, uh, to their characters. I think they're, they were phenomenal in the way that they handled us, us all, a lot of us being minors. Absolutely, thank you so much. And did you guys have a good time this hour? You guys are Thank awesome. You. you guys are here all weekend, right? What's that? You here all weekend? Wait, it's the weekend? It is. <laughs>